Good afternoon. I'm Bill Bain from Scaleout Software. We're going to talk about building and deploying digital twin models on in-memory data grids for real-time streaming analytics. So how many of you were at Nikita Ivanov's uh, keynote this morning and heard him talk about simplicity? So one of the motivating factors for digital twin models is driving simplicity in stream processing and making uh, it easier for an application to introspect on streaming data without complexity of typical stream processing platforms. So I'm Bill Bain. I'm the founder and CEO of Scaleout Software. My career has been focused on data parallel computing at Intel supercomputers and Bell Laboratories. I also uh, founded Scaleout Software uh, for, to create in-memory data grids for scaling application performance with in-memory data storage that scales and is highly available, and also to enable operational intelligence, the ability to and introspect and analyze fast-changing data to provide real-time feedback to a live system and help that system perform better. And stream processing is an example of operational intelligence. So what we're going to talk about today, first of all, are some of the goals and challenges for stream processing. What are some of the complexities that we can find in typical environments? And then how do we overcome them with real-time digital twins and what that term really means? So we'll look at some of the advantages they have over previous approaches, some target use cases, and then uh, we'll look at how in-memory computing and in-memory computing platforms are a really good execution vehicle for real-time digital twins and stream processing. And then we'll also look at new APIs that we have developed to host real-time digital twins and look at uh, the, how that's implemented within an in-memory data grid. And then I'll give you a sneak peek at a, a cloud service that we're working on to uh, provide digital twins as a service, as a cloud service. So the goal of stream processing is pretty obvious, but it's to be able to maximize situational awareness and real-time control by ingesting uh, streams of data, analyzing that data, hopefully in the context of what you know about data sources, be able to do aggregate analysis on that data so you can find patterns of interest across multiple data sources and then provide both <coughs> alerts to humans and feedback to a live system to help control that system and respond to the live events that are occurring. There are many applications, here are a few, we'll talk about some of them, medical monitoring, logistics and manufacturing, fraud detection, e-commerce recommendations. IoT is a very important area for uh, streaming analytics, but there are many other applications as well. And uh, financial applications abound, such as fraud detection. We saw that in the previous talk. So here's a quick example, one that uh, I've seen actually a company has, this is a, there's a company that's actually doing this. They're not using digital twins. Uh, but uh, what they're trying to do is monitor something like 7,000 medical refrigerators around the United States. And uh, I'm sure you understand that medical refrigerators hold uh, seriously mission critical contents uh, that cannot be lost if the refrigerator fails. So the goal is to do predictive analytics, predict failure in advance, and then respond to get the materials taken out and put in another refrigerator before they can thaw. And also, uh, it would be really good if you could look at patterns. Maybe there's a power outage. Maybe there's a set of refrigerators that were just installed that have a defect. If you can analyze uh, in an aggregate way, multiple refrigerators, then you can do a better job of responding. This pattern we'll see over and over again, the ability not only to introspect more deeply on one data source, but to actually look across data sources through data parallel computing and find patterns that you can then apply in your response to the conditions that are occurring. Now, the challenge here um, is that Typical stream processing pipelines are relatively complicated for application developers uh, because they are pipeline oriented or acyclic graph oriented uh, like Apache Storm and others. And the problem here is that this creates complexity. You have to figure out how do I divide up the logic into pipeline stages. You have to then also extract the events of interest because the events that stream in from many data sources are multiplexed into one pipeline for processing. That creates complexity. And then it's also hard to figure out how, do, how would I embed data parallel analytics in a stream processing pipeline. Uh, also, there are performance challenges. A key challenge is that if you want to keep any state associated with the data source, it has to be done in an ad hoc manner in a separate data store, a database, or, um, or, a data, or a distributed cache. And this creates a network bottleneck. 
Also, just getting a pipeline to scale for thousands of data sources is non-trivial. It's something the application developer should not be concerned with. <coughs> and finally, it's very difficult to run aggregate analytics, as I just mentioned, in a stream processing pipeline. For that reason, people created the Lambda architecture several years ago. I guess uh, I want to ask how many of you are familiar with the Lambda architecture? So most of you are. Okay, so what it's doing is dividing up in incoming data into the fast path and the slow path. The fast path is doing rudimentary real-time analysis, if any, um, and only able to lightly look at the data uh, because of the fact that it doesn't have an environment in which to do deep introspection. If most of the data is pushed either through ETL or directly into a, onto disk, into HDFS for Spark or any or some other or in a file system for analysis offline. Uh, that brings to mind we, we were working with a large pizza company in the U.S. and uh, they get data from thousands of their pizza shops all over the U.S. and they have to do things such as figure out. Uh, which stores are doing well, which managers are not doing well, uh, which stores need more supplies of a given type. And so they stage all of the streaming data into the file system, and it takes hours for them uh, to be able to then ETL that into, uh, it, at the time it was Hadoop and uh, HDFS for Hadoop, to analyze it. Um, there are countless examples of that. Another is a cable system provider that we were working with, uh, taking channel change events, and they were streaming them all into, onto disk uh, in order to do recommendations to cable viewers, but by the time they could get that information off the disk and analyze it, you, the, the cable viewer had long since changed channels. Um, however, you know, a large grocery store, is, there's one in the U.S. that uh, um, I'm thinking of a chain that uh, what they, they typically do this offline batch processing for next day uh, emails. And so they recognize there's so much latency, they don't even try to respond in real time to make recommendations. So in any case, is there a better approach than this, right? So that's, this is where real-time digital twins come in. Real-time digital twins are a software technique for, and I can give you the slide deck, just ask them, so you don't need to bother with that. Just, Give me your card, and I'll uh, give you a slide deck. Um, but you're welcome to take pictures as well. Um, for what it's the, one of the key values of it is to simplify application development and to enable deeper introspection. So what it's doing is it's tracking the dynamic state of the data sources and as, as state, one state object per data source. It's also automatically letting the system correlate correlate the events from a given data source so the logic can analyze just those events from a given data source. And it allows the logic to be uh, co-located in one place. So you don't have to create pipeline stages and figure out how do I break up the pipeline, pipeline and figure out what are the performance implications of that. You simply write the logic for processing an event message in one place and have co-located in-memory state instantly available. So, it also provides a basis for data parallel computation across the state objects, and we'll get into those details in a minute. So it's a software framework uh, that's used for both orchestrating logic, which could be machine learning or rules engine. It doesn't have to be plain old Java code or C-sharp code, but it, the key value is to simplify application development. So there are other uses of this term. This term goes back to 2002. It was created by Michael Greaves, a professor, I believe, at the University of Michigan. And it was used primarily for uh, product lifecycle management and product design. Think of building jets, uh, Boeing jets, Air, Airbus jets, um, since we're here. Um, and uh, taking all the components and being able to organize them on the computer. So you want to have a digital twin of a physical component so you can understand how all the pieces fit together. And that concept is what uh, Azure uses in their use of the word digital twin. It's more of a, as a use at a design phase, not for real-time stream processing. Uh, there are other uses of the term. Uh, first, uh, it has been used in product lifestyle uh, life cycle management to interpret telemetry. Often manufacturers will make a pump, put it out in the field, and then want telemetry to come back, not for stream processing, but so they can assess the performance of that device and see if, if they could improve its design. So that's another use. Uh, in terms of stream processing, it's used in a rudimentary sense. AWS and Azure both use it to host parameters 
and small amounts of data associated with a device, but it's not used for introspection on incoming events. It's used to host parameters that you might want to have access to when you get an event. So let's look into a little more detail about what a digital twin actually is. Make sure that, yeah. Uh, it consists of two things. A message processor, which is the logic that the application writes or encapsulates a rules engine or other technique uh, when a message is received. And so the, all of the analysis of an incoming event is encapsulated into a message processor, which is simply a method, a Java method or a C-sharp method. And this method receives incoming events from a device or a data source, to be a human if it's a click for e-commerce, and it also can receive commands from a human. And then it sends alerts out or it sends uh, uh, commands back to the data source itself. So it's an intermediary between humans and a data source. It's also used to introspect on telemetry. And the second important part is a state object, which is hosting this per data source or device state. I use the terms interchangeably in this talk. When I'm talking to an IoT audience, I use the term device. Uh, so you'll see both terms used. Uh, but a device could be a human. So uh, just think of it as a data source. So this is dynamic context for analyzing events. And if you think about it, it's a really obvious thing to want to have. If uh, th there's an example about um, monitoring uh, telemetry from a smartwatch, right? So if you're getting heart rate telemetry from a smartwatch, uh, you can do a much better job of understanding what an excursion in heart rate means if you know if the person, what the person's age is, what their medical condition is, what medications they took recently, uh, what events they might have had in the last few weeks, uh, what they're doing. So all of this context gives you, uh, it enriches the context, uh, the, the data you have for introspection on what an event means and allows you to react in a more intelligent manner. There is one such data object for each data source or device. There's one model for a class of devices. So you might have one for all heart rate watches or for all refrigerators. Um, and you might have different types of refrigerators. But there's the model, uh, the message processor corresponds to a digital twin model. And it spawns a state object for every device it sees within that model. So some of the advantages we've talked about, I won't belabor it, um, are it simplifies application design by providing this automatic event correlation. It also is providing a very nice object-oriented view of the steam stream processing application. It's allowing the logic and the state object to be defined as classes in a, in a language like Java and very easily then uh, sent out to an in-memory data grid for execution. And it's dynamically tracking the state of each device to help analyze the events as we talked about. This is a better picture here of a digital twin. Um, the earlier picture is a little more complicated. Uh, we've simplified it in this view here. There's a state object and a message processing uh, logic piece of code. So those are the two things the developer writes. And the rest is just handled by the platform. Uh, it's also providing a nice orchestration layer for more complicated analytics code. So if you have a rules engine, you can just orchestrate that to be run as under the process message method, and it will get sent out to a grid and executed. Uh, an interesting one is machine learning. We saw an example in the previous talk. And um, you would train offline, but then you could have uh, different machine learning uh, code running in each uh, for processing incoming events and being updated in real time uh, from offline, but different ones for different types of devices. So it's very easy to separate the offline work from the online work of machine learning with this technique. And then this provides, as I said, the basis for aggregate analysis. We'll talk about that in a minute. So one of the things that makes it easier to use the traditional stream processing pipeline is that it's state-centric and not event-centric. So what does that mean? If you think about a pipeline, it's really focused on what do I do with an event? All the events flow in, and the goal of each pipeline stage is process an event. And then the rest of what you do is, you know, that's up to the application. Whereas a digital twin model is state-centric, an event is always delivered to the state object corresponding to that data source. So you instantly, in your message processor, have all the context you need to intelligently analyze that event. So this is, not only is it simplifying the application, it's avoiding this need for ad hoc state storage because the 
events are shipped to the state object and the state object is not pulled into a cluster for execution within a pipeline. And that uh, reduces the opportunity for a network bottleneck because less data is moved. Only the events are shipped and not the data of the state objects. So context never has to move. It also means that when performing aggregate analysis, the domain is the state objects and the uh, state objects don't have to get moved out to another store for data parallel analysis. So avoiding network bottlenecks one of my uh, experiences in working in in-memory data grids for years is the problem is not memory, it's not CPU, it's always the network. And anything you can do to mitigate network overhead is, is good. So uh, this is another way to help reduce that overhead. Now interestingly, uh, this question comes, comes up a lot, can digital, digital twins access a database? And the answer is of course yes, because the message processor can do anything it wants. And typically it might retrieve parameters and history uh, from the database for a device. So it recognizes a new device, a new message comes in, it, or say you're doing fraud detection and uh, somebody makes a credit card transaction. Well, you might not have a state object for that customer, but you will go retrieve it from the database and host it in the state object. And from then on, next time you get a transaction, you will have all the context about that person, you know, what we saw in the previous talk. Uh, the, you know, their account history, uh, other transactions they've done today, um, and their credit rating, whatever is relevant to a fraud detection algorithm. Uh, also, you can push data out of memory into a database. So, for example, if you want to log all of the events of significance, and I think um, there's another uh, two slides from now, talk about using this for filtering. We'll come back to that. So again, uh, Digital twins are really good for aggregate analysis and you can find patterns across multiple twins by looking at the state objects and performing operations on them. A typical operation is MapReduce. How many of you are familiar with MapReduce? I'm gonna assume everybody is. Yeah, by now, after Hadoop, everybody understands MapReduce. So uh, MapReduce allows you to look at the uh, at properties within the state objects across all of the digital twins in this usage uh, for, uh, across all the digital twins of a given type, that's shown at the top there. I'll use the laser here, or I won't. No, well, I guess I won't, there it is. <laughs> Can anybody see that? Okay, um, and then that allows the results that can be grouped uh, according to another property. So for example, compute the average vehicle speed by extracting the vehicle speed out of every digital twin corresponding to a vehicle, and then average it by county, where county is another property in the state object. And so, in fact, I don't know if it's obvious to everybody, it took me a couple of years to suddenly realize that uh, group by in Excel is just a map reduce. So what the reducers are doing, or what the mappers are doing is the group by and all the computation, or most of it other than the combiners, is being done in the reducers. So the reducers are then creating a set of results, one for each group that you've specified. And this, notice this can run concurrently with event processing and again, it's avoiding network bottlenecks because the data from the state objects is not moving. It's just being extracted and computed on. And it means that you don't have to push all of the state objects into HDFS for Spark and do it later. You could do it right now. In fact, you can feed it back immediately. Example that I'm, I'm bringing up a little, little bit, but I'll tell you this now, is in the health tracking, um, if say you're, these are Orange Theory, the health watches for Orange Theory and you're, you know, you have a, thousands of people uh, across the country that are doing heavy exercise, you can look at patterns by age. For example, you can see maximum heart rate on this machine by age and see what's happening and then take that and feed that back so that if a person says, well, I think I'm healthy, but if they're deviating from the norm for the majority of the people that are running on those, or on those machines, then they can get an alert. That's an example of aggregate analysis feeding back in real time to a live system. And there are better examples in disaster recovery, which we'll get to in a minute. So again, you can use this for ETL or filtering. This actually came up, I recognize this, I went to a Gartner conference in Orlando a couple of months ago, and they're very interested in IoT and digital twins at Gartner. They think that's a, an up and coming trend. Um, and uh, 
Uh, this, one of the reasons I coined this term, real-time digital twin, because of the fact of the confusion of digital twins in general from real-time for stream processing. But one of the things I recognize is that uh, this problem of in IoT, how do you filter all this telemetry and only put events of significance into uh, a data lake for analysis? Uh, well, digital twins, you can think of them as just a big filter, uh, if nothing else. If you don't want to use them for feedback, you can use them to simply extract the events that are of particular interest, like oh, give me all the temperature readings that are over a threshold, and dump those in for each device. So now you can analyze events of significance and not this deluge of telemetry that might be coming in. Um, they avoid network bottlenecks, as I mentioned, because you don't need an ad hoc store associated with a pipeline. And we talked about that a few minutes ago. So they leverage in-memory computing in ways that I think are pretty obvious at this point. For each device or data source, you can have an object in the grid, and we'll talk more about that, uh, to, to host it. So it's very natural. That means that you can get scalable throughput for stream processing without any application intervention. For example, you don't have to figure out, do I need another pipeline stage? Do I need another bolt in storm? Um, do I need to connect these with you know, fan out of two or fan out of four? You don't have to think about any of that. You don't have to say, how many instances of a bolt do I need? You simply create the digital twins you need and let the grid scale the processing by adding more servers to host the digital twin objects and run the message processor methods within that grid. And it also means the data parallel computation, it's just, which is already built into the grid, pre-built in can just take advantage of uh, those objects and analyze them and feed that back without any extra data motion or um, new techniques being developed. So as a result, you can get this kind of performance. You can think about processing an event in one to two milliseconds. Interestingly, in our, some of our early measurements, the, the message hub, which we'll talk about in a minute, like Azure IoT Hub, you know, is taking more like uh, 10 milliseconds to deliver the message from an external data source. But our analysis, you know, we can get it to the right server, get the object read, and, and call that method, and return a result back to the message hub in about one to two milliseconds. So it's very fast. And we've observed a data parallel computing on hundreds of thousands of objects uh, to be in the order of a few seconds. It varies with what you're doing and how many objects, but we're talking a few seconds, not a minute. Um, so um, and we're talking also about scaling to millions of objects. I put 100,000 because most of the examples use 100,000, but it's very easy to scale a grid um, to host hundreds of thousands of objects, depending, of course, on how big they are. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through about five use cases, but I'll do it really briefly. This is the one I've been discussing. Um, well, it's coming up, the health tracking one we'll talk about. Here are several examples. We'll talk about uh, all of these except fraud detection today. And we'll see how the digital twin model gives you fast response time and situational awareness. So the first one is this health uh, device tracking. I talked about this last year at this conference, so I won't belabor it. But the key point is that if you have this knowledge about um, about a human, when you get the telemetry that's giving metrics about their performance, you can do a much better job of analyzing. And in, and in addition, you can do this data parallel analysis and feed that back in real time, as I just mentioned. Here's another example in disaster recovery. Um, I went to an IoT conference about a month ago, and I was looking at potential applications for digital twin, real-time digital twins. And you know, a lot of applications don't really fit because they don't have this need for fast response um, and uh, an intelligent aggregate uh, analysis to deliver a response. For example, if you're looking at gas meters or, you know, or electric lights, um, you know, and they have you know, hundreds of thousands of devices in a city, you know, the smart cities effort is really gathering momentum. Uh, Singapore is driving that as, as an example of a city that's converting itself to a completely smart city. But most of the devices give slow, slowly changing data, and uh, they don't really need this kind of uh, overwhelming uh, stream processing response. But there are other examples where you really would want it, and I think at some point people will realize uh, that also the sensors can be improved. Right now, for example, if there's a gas leak, you get an indication, um, you know, there is a gas leak, and it gets, it gets published uh, uh, for uh, the, the utility to 
uh, subscribe to and says, okay, there's a gas leak, I'll send somebody out and take care of it. But uh, an intelligence sensor would say, you know, there might be a gas leak, or maybe there isn't, or maybe this device is known to have this much leakage. Or in the case of a fire, uh, you, know, you, you know how a smoke alarm, maybe somebody's cooking, so you can imagine doing some of this machine learning we saw in the previous talk to really make an assessment as to what a sensor is telling you. And that's where a digital twin would come into play because you can embed this analysis in the digital twin and make a much more intelligent decision about whether or not you have a problem that needs an immediate response. But the thing, the real value add is uh, looking at multiple sensors and doing this data parallel analysis. This is just a simple example. Uh, I think of a larger scale, think about the Paradise Fire in California. And you know when the fire emerged, where else was the fire? Which roads should not be used? Uh, you know, which way should evacuees go? And this is usually done by humans today, but this could be put into a digital twin system such that if you have multiple sensors, here's an example where a fire is going up the side of a building, and a parallel analysis will tell you that with multiple digital twins indicate a potential fire, that you might have a fire going up that building and that fire escape shouldn't be used, something like that. So the idea is with aggregate, an aggregate analysis of multiple sensors, we can do a much better job of response. Here's another example um, in security monitoring. Uh, it's the same idea, but it's for a security perimeter. You can imagine a large complex has thousands of door and uh, window sensors. Um, I, I used to work at Microsoft, and I went in one day on a Sunday, and uh, I went into a lab, and I opened the door, and I left it open because it was hot, and two minutes later, in comes a security guard and says, okay, this door is left open for two minutes. So I, I thought there was a threat. So you know, uh, so you, you can see that you can make some, if with, you can analyze what a sensor is telling you, you can determine whether or not there's a threat or not a threat. Maybe somebody's using a door too much or they're leaving it open the way I did. In any case, uh, you have both the introspection on a single sensor plus the aggregate analysis. So if you do have an intrusion on a perimeter, it would be nice to know where else that intrusion might be occurring so you can react in a holistic manner and not just on a point-by-point -point basis. I think people are just beginning to think about doing this with this approach, this digital twin approach. So here's the last example, I think. Um, no, there's one more. Uh, fleet tracking. So at this IoT conference, the guy from Avis says, we have 100,000 rental cars on the road at once. I thought, I, wow, that kind of blew my mind. So you can imagine how, uh, first of all, you can respond to a given driver with a digital twin, um, and you can actually see the digital twin over there on the right. Uh, so, you know, a driver might be lost or might be erratic, uh, might be speeding uh, consistently. And uh, so you could respond appropriately, maybe have somebody call them on the cell phone. Uh, but also, if you have a highway blockage or, you know, an accident somewhere, you can see how it affects a set of your vehicles, especially a trucking fleet, and then redirect those vehicles to optimize uh, what they're doing and avoid the effect of regional issue. You can imagine that with air traffic and other uh, applications. So finally, e-commerce recommendations. This is pretty obvious uh, that you know you have uh, hundreds of thousands of shoppers in, in an e-commerce, a large e-commerce site like Nordstrom, for example, or, or Amazon. And um, so you can maintain a digital twin for each shopper, which keeps track of their preferences, their brand preferences, their shopping history, uh, what they bought recently. Uh, and and also the features of the products they're looking at now so that you can then make recommendations in a few milliseconds based on all of this context. We actually built a full up recommendation engine around this concept and that led us to the digital twin model because it fell out with just implementing uh, real time recommendations it fell out to be a digital twin problem. Um, so that you have for each shopper a digital twin with all this information in addition uh, you can perform this collaborative analysis to see uh, what people are doing, how large are the baskets, should we do a flash sale, provide all of this telemetry in real time immediately within seconds to the merchandiser um, so that the e-commerce site can be optimized. So that's another example. In all of these examples, the common thread is the need for real-time response and an aggregate view of the data. Okay, so now we're gonna to shift topics to how do you build and deploy a digital twin model? And um, 
it's pretty simple. The first step is you build a model using uh, these APIs, which I'll show you in just a minute. They're very simple. And you just deploy them through another set of APIs to an in-memory data grid. I'm not giving a product pitch, so I'm not going to tell you how great our grid is and how great our APIs are. I'm just going to tell you the concepts, and you can imagine any vendor providing this. Okay, so the idea here is that you have APIs for building digital twins and other APIs for deploying them to a grid. And that means that you don't have to worry about the intricacies of managing the grid at all. So, and then uh, there's a need to connect to what I'll call a message hub. And the Azure IoT, uh, Kafka REST service, or AWS IoT hubs uh, can all be considered a message hub. And you need a, a nice, simple way to tell the grid, go talk to that hub. Here are my connection parameters to authenticate me. And then all the data sources that want to send to you can send through that hub to you using their favorite uh, a protocol. So these things are out there today. And uh, AWS is a pub sub technique. Azure um, has a very nice, has some very nice features for scaling and, and so forth. I'm sure you guys know about Kafka brokers and so forth. All right. so. Um, I added this slide last night thinking, you know, people who say, why are you telling me about APIs? The question is, why create new APIs? And the idea is that it really simplifies design. In particular, um, you can avoid doing all the things in the top half here. You don't have to worry about reading and updating state objects and managing their lifetimes. You don't have to worry about how do I stage the code in the grid and how, does, how in general does code get staged in a grid. You don't have to worry about how do I use, uh, in, in our case, reactive extensions uh, APIs to send messages to the observers that are going to handle those messages on the right host for that state object. So all of these complexities are just eliminated. Um, you just focus on defining the message processing code for each type of data source defining the state object, and describing any data parallel analytics you might want to run. So uh, the Digital Twin Builder APIs that we have look like this. This is pseudocode that's distilled from Java and C Sharp. We, uh, we have Java, C Sharp, and, and JavaScript. But the concept is simply, um, and this seems trivial, but you know, it took a while to figure out what's the right thing to deliver. Um, like, for example, do you give people an event list you know, of the events they've already seen? Yes or no? That's, I mean, we struggled with that idea for a while. So this is the approach we came up with, which is you give, uh, this is an application-defined method. We just called it uh, pro process message. And so you implement uh, this class, and, um, and so it, you feed it a state object, which will get out of the grid and then hand to this method. A processing context, which simply means APIs for sending messages either to other twins in a hierarchy or back to the data sources themselves. And then a message list. And that, again, was another learning. It's not a message, it's a message list, because it turns out these message hubs might collect a bunch of messages in during your round trip time. And if you can deliver them all at once, you can do latency hiding and get overall throughput uh, much higher and simplify the acknowledgment process. So, uh, this, these are the parameters to process message. And the rest is really trivial. There's a builder uh, model being used to, to set up the digital twin model in the grid. You simply give it, tell it where the dependencies for the code are. This varies on the lang on language by language basis. Um, and then you t describe the model to it, the various types in the model, the message processor type, the um, state object type, and also what an event message looks like. Um, and then this will deploy the model to the grid and start the message processing. And then, of course, the models, the way we designed it is will automatically generate a new state object when it sees a new data source ID. And then lastly, uh, there's another connector builder for connecting to various uh, message hubs like Azure IoT and AWS. And what this is doing is authenticating the connection and then receiving messages and forwarding them to the digital twin instances to run the message processors and handling the return path and handling high availability for acknowledgments. So those are the elements of a digital twin model. So building the model itself, deploying it with the builder, and then uh, deploying connectors. Now, um, this is an example I'm going to give you, the one code sample, so you know it's real. This, this is runnable. By the way, you can download this. If you go to our website, we have a Java sample, a JavaScript sample, and a, and a C-sharp sample. This is the C-sharp sample, because it's the one I'm most familiar with um, for all you Java developers. <laughs> so um, in any case, 
it's analyzing temperature telemetry from a wind turbine. And the point of this is to show you the value of having context and having state. It's a very trivial example, as, but the idea is, what can I do with context that I would be, it would be difficult to do without context? And in this case, what it's doing is it's tracking for each model of wind turbine uh, what's called a pre-maintenance period. So it's going to determine whether or not this turbine is in some period before it's due for maintenance. And then it's going to look at over temp or temperature indication events. And if it sees an over temp, uh, it will, depending on whether it's not in or not in a pre-maintenance period, it will allow that condition to persist for a different length of time. So you can see how it has to know about the model. It has to know about the, what, how long the pre-maintenance period is. It has to know w whether it's in it. And it has to know how long uh, an over temp duration uh, is allowed, g given what period it's in. So, um, uh, so the message processor does that. And we'll see that code right now. Its code looks a little hairy, but it's really pretty simple, actually. So this is what a state object looks like. That's a real state object. Uh, it's just an implementation of what we call digital twin base. It's, we decided to put everything in JSON because that way the data parallel analytics can always extract properties uh, independent of what the application is doing just by knowing the property name. Um, so that we serialize into JSON in our implementation. So you can see that it knows that the time span for pre-maintenance is, you can only have over temp for two minutes, but you can allow 10 minutes if it's not in a pre-maintenance period. And then you, uh, of course, track the model and the maintenance date, which is hokey there because it's, it's always in advance at the current time. But it would be some known date retrieved out of a database. Um, and then you just track, are we in an over temp and how many messages are we getting in the over temp? This is an example of a list. What we decided is let applications put events in a list. We have a set of time windowing libraries, and there are other ones. But the idea is instead of forcing event lists on people that might grow and use up uh, you know, unbounded amounts of memory, let the application define its own event list. In this case, we put only significant <coughs> events in the event list, not every event. Um, that's, that was counterintuitive. It seems obvious, but it took a lot of thought. Um, so this is a message processor method, and you can see that it has the elements that I just described, processing context, a state object, and an ienumerable of messages. And so what it's doing, first of all, this code is just looking to see, you know, are we in the pre-maintenance period based on our model? And so the answer is yes or no. Then it's going to go through all the messages and look for an over temp condition or see if when we're in an over temp condition, uh, do we, is it, can we resolve it? Because we're not, we don't get, we're not getting an over temp event anymore. So this is the code that was referred to in the previous page. Uh, this is how handling an over temp. So the first part is determining, are we entering an over temp condition? And the second is, uh, based on the pre-maintenance period and the duration allowed, uh, do we send an alert? So if it's within, I mean, if it's more than two minutes, then, uh, and we're in pre-maintenance, we send an alert. If it's less, you know, it's over uh, 10 minutes, and because we're not in pre-maintenance, <clears throat> then we send an alert. So that's an example of using context to decide whether to alert. And that context is held in the state object. I realize it's trivial, but it gives you the idea of what to do. Um, so resolving is pretty trivial. You just uh, reset the, the Boolean. Hope that makes sense. That's an example of a digital twin. It shows you the whole code that's required. Notice there's nothing about in-memory data grids here. There's nothing about create, read, update, delete. There's nothing about you know, MQTT protocols. It's just all uh, code handling of incoming events based on context. <laughs> this is the real C-sharp code for deploying the model and the real C-sharp code for connecting to the hub, just as an example to show you. So I got to wrap up in 12 minutes, but leave time for questions. I'm almost done. Uh, the rest is pretty straightforward. Uh, so first of all, before I tell you how to host a digital twin on a grid, I'm going to tell you how a grid does things in general, for those who don't know. Um, so an in-memory data grid typically has two pieces, a data grid, which is a set of grid service processes, uh, which are hosting the uh, objects, the serialized objects, which in our case will host state objects. And then in our implementation, which was similar to what we saw with Hazelcast, you have a set of processes uh, which host the code, the method code, for running the message processors. And we call that an invocation grid. It also runs the connectors. So these would be JVMs or .NET runtimes at the top, the IG workers. And the bottom ones uh, 
uh, could be JVMs if you have a Java-based uh, grid or maybe something else. In our case, um, we run this in, uh, in C. This is a C, uh, our grid service. And it's very fast and very compact. Uh, but it doesn't require JVM to host the, the objects. So um, this is how, what we're actually doing for digital twins. So there's three grids, conceptually. There's um, one grid, which is the data grid. Now it's vertical. The data grid is hosting the state objects. The worker grid is hosting a digital twin model. So there's one worker grid for every model in our current implementation, uh, but you wouldn't have to have that. Um, in any case, the one invocation grid is hosting um, the running of the models. And then a separate grid, we call a connector grid, is hosting the connectors to the hubs. And in our case, it's one per hub, but it wouldn't have to be. And then finally, and look in the middle, you'll see the little object. Um, we, the connector steers a given event from a, from a given data source is associated with some object. So that's the only time we're going to do network hops to get there. Once we're there, um, the, the IG worker on this server will run, uh, will access this state object and process and do the message processing and, um, and so forth. Now, uh, with our Kafka implementation, we actually, you can tell Kafka how to partition its messages across brokers, and you can actually get Kafka to have this broker talk to that connector to talk to for, this, for an object hosted on that server. It's a little bit of a trick, but it can be done so you can avoid network hops. Network hops are, you know, that's what costs scalable throughput. So now I'm going to give you a preview of what a UI would look like for running uh, digital twins in the cloud. So think of this as digital twins as a service in the cloud. Um, so what you would do is you specify, you first build a digital twin model in Java or C Sharp or JavaScript in our case, and then you specify a language runtime, give it a name, and then upload a file, which is usually a zip file, which has the code and all the dependencies. And then you say create. And then uh, you can then deploy a connector. Similarly, you just specify the connector type and to give it a name and give it the connection parameters and say deploy, and it will connect. So that's two steps. Third step is you can manage the digital twin model and see what's going on, get messages. So that because it's user-defined code, it can crash, right? And you want to be able to look at the messages and decide whether to restart it. So uh, that's, this allows you to manage each model and restart the models as necessary. You can also drill down and look at all the state properties uh, within a state object for any instance of a digital twin by specifying the model and the ID for that data source. And the last part, which is kind of cool, I think, is you can create these things called widgets, which are performing this periodic MapReduce every five or 10 seconds. And what you do is you specify, uh, you give it a name, you specify the model, specify a type of chart, a state field, what, what kind of operator, average, max, min, and then a group by field. And then once you say create, it just creates it and starts running MapReduce every few seconds, and it refreshes a chart that you put on the screen uh, that shows you for each group, this would be every group, it would show you the value of the, in this case, the average value of some parameter, some property in the state objects. And typically you would have, you know, dozens of these widgets, and you could be looking at dynamically aggregate properties of all of the digital twins. So that's an example of what um, a digital twin as a service cloud service would look like, which is the other trend that uh, Nikita talked about this morning. Two out, we hit two out of four, simplicity, hopefully, and cloud-based. So um, I think those are two trends that I also agree are definitely need work in, in memory computing. So these are the takeaways, my last slide. So as we've seen, the stream processing can be very challenging, and the, the traditional approach with the Lambda architecture is very limiting in its semantics and what you can do in real time. And these real-time digital twins as a software concept give us the opportunity for deeper introspection while at the same time simplifying design by eliminating all of the artifacts of a streaming pipeline and in-memory data grid data parallel computing just uh, lets you focus on the stream processing application and yet at the same time delivering fast performance. So the goal here and what I hope there are steps towards is improving situational awareness in an application 
and the ability to do real-time response that's effective. And running these on an in-memory data grid, especially if you can hide the details, gives you a very fast, scalable platform that's also highly available. So that's it. Are there any questions? Well, don't, don't all speak at once. OK, yeah. Yeah, uh, grids can easily handle five million objects, and uh, 10 terabytes is easily within the capabilities of a grid. If you think about it, you could put a terabyte on a server these days, and that's only 10 servers. It's actually 20 with high availability, but you, you're right in the right sort of numbers. When you hit 100 terabytes, that's going to be expensive, but uh, sure. And as far as a scalable throughput, because the grid is scaling its throughput as along with its storage, it should be able to keep up. Of course, you could always run an algorithm you know, that's going to do a regression or something and take forever, but you wouldn't do that anyway because you want to be able to respond in a few milliseconds. So the algorithms will be relatively short running in within the message processor. Well, it all depends on the serialization. We chose uh, for our particular implementation to use uh, JSON, which is not particularly <laughs> compressing, but one could uh, implement uh, other serialization al um, algorithms um, and with, with compression. That's what I'm trying to do is with this just explain how you would build it in general, but you could add features like compression uh, you, said, you know, as an artifact or uh, of the uh, state object. You, you know, so it could be done. Any other questions? You guys are ready for the break, I can tell. Thank you very much, appreciate it.